We are back. That's right. We are back to the race and ethnic relations on campus podcast show. I am Dr. B. I am Dr. B. And this is show number 50. That's right. 50. 50. Right here on the Race and Ethnic Relations on Campus podcast show. And we have a special, special, I have a special show for you. This is a, a show in which I hosted, I hosted a panel discussion, a panel discussion on human rights and social justice. It was a round table, human rights and social justice round table on racism and social injustice at a conference, the Society for Applied Anthropology. And I'm going to play the entire uh, um, session for you in this podcast show. Uh, I'll get to it in just a second. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me thank my sponsors. Let me thank my sponsors. Podbean, Podbean, iTunes, I, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Google Play, uh, iHeartRadio, iHeartRadio, Intune, Intune, Listen FM, Listen FM, and uh, all, uh, uh, as well as ABC Clio, ABC Clio, my 2018 book, still going on strong, 2018 book, Race and Ethnic Relations. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so again, this is a special, a special podcast show. It runs about one hour and 30 minutes. Uh, this again, the setup for this backdrop of this is is that I hosted, uh, I arranged uh, uh, on um, to host a roundtable discussion among three of my uh, colleagues, esteemed uh, uh, faculty members at different universities across the United States, and uh, basically I, I'm. I'm in the roundtable, I, I explain everything uh, of the setup, but again, I enjoyed this roundtable, and we, we were able to really personalize the issues uh, and yet frame it out uh, academically. So here is show number 50, where I host a panel discussion as a chairperson of the Human Rights and Social Justice uh, Committee with the Society for Applied Anthropology. The roundtable discussion was entitled Racism and Social Injustice. Here we go. Jan, uh, I truly appreciate the uh, uh, introduction and the overview of our session. Again, my, my name is Dr. Bailey. I'm going to describe myself. Uh, I, I see, um, want to make sure I describe myself. Uh, I'm an African American. Uh, I'm I'm wearing a blue shirt, blue shirt. I have a background right here uh, that's kind of flexible. Uh, I'm a professor at East Carolina University in North Carolina and been here for 15 years. Uh, and, um, wanted to, and I'm the chair of the uh, uh, Human Rights and Social Justice Committee. Uh, and I, I felt that it was the need to present this type of informal roundtable discussion, informal roundtable discussion. And, uh, and I, I invited uh, uh, Dr. Joe Heyman, Heyman, as well as uh, Dr. Mark Edberg, as well as Dr. Sarah Alexander will join us uh, a little bit later. Uh, she's coming from another session. So I'm going to introduce myself a little bit and give you the dynamics of this roundtable. Uh, again, I want to keep this a bit informal, a lot, really a lot informal, because this is a very serious issue of racism and social justice, not just in the U.S., but around the world. And uh, I wanted to, uh, here's my major framing this uh, discussion out, this roundtable discussion. Number one, I want to define racism and social injustice along with perhaps some relevant theories to better understand the concepts uh, because, again, we, these are issues that we say every, you know, talk about, but we don't define them. Uh, two, we want to uh, discuss how these concepts are viewed from our, our Western perspective and how they may be viewed differently, differently uh, from, uh, from other countries' perspective. Three, provide some relevant examples of these issues today uh, and unfortunately we have a number of examples today in the U.S. and other countries and then four provide the audience the present viewing audience and then those who look at this uh, pre-recorded portion of it how applied anthropologists 
can help resolve and and help others to better understand uh, the impact of these issues on our world today. Uh, and so those are just the uh, talking points or the framework of our discussion. And uh, and I want this to be as informal as possible, but you know, have a, a regular dialogue. So those are the, the general framework. And uh, now I want to uh, open it up to uh, Dr. Heyman, introduce himself, and then Dr. Uh, uh, Ember uh, introduced himself, and then I want to uh, uh, talk about, start with the definitions of racism and social injustice. So uh, that's an overview. Uh, if uh, Dr. Heyman, Joe, can you go next? Yes, thank, thank you so much, uh, Eric, and it's great that you uh, organized this. We appreciate it. Um, and for everybody who's uh, putting on the event, thank you so much. Um, and, and I should mention that while you were uh, starting, uh, Sarah Alexander joined us, so she also should introduce herself in here. Um, I'm an a, a older, middle-aged white man uh, with a mustache and curly hair and um, a backdrop of um, the, my university, University of Texas at El Paso, which is a desert landscape with uh, un, uh, unexpectedly enough uh, building some modeled on the Himalayan country of Bhutan. Um, that's actually what UTEP looks like. Um, so uh, um, I'm the director of the Center for Inter-American and Border Studies, as well as professor of anthropology at the University of Texas, El Paso. And we're on the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and uh, I have worked on a number of uh, border issues um, here, I, really, I want to talk about the complexity of, of transnational uh, racism and, and anti-racism uh, in the current migration context of the U.S.-Mexico border. So maybe uh, uh, Mark can uh, speak next. Yeah, hi. Uh, welcome to everybody, and thanks, Eric, again for, for putting this all together. I am a um, white, middle-aged male boy does that sound <laughs> whenever i say that it sounds so uh, so boring can i maybe i have tattoos on my face but i don't um i have uh, light brown hair and i've got a black sweater on in my background today just because i've decided to avoid showing my my uh, disorganized office here is the altunca in belize it's a, it's a mayan um archaeological site and it's so it's very green background I am a professor in the Milken Institute School of Public Health at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. I am also um, in the Anthropology Department at GW and in the Elliott School of Foreign Affairs. And I have two centers. Uh, one of them is called the Avance Center for the Advancement of Immigrant and Refugee Health. Um, that is a center that uh, largely works on different interventions and research related to health uh, inequities, partly with Latino, but uh, with other immigrant populations as well. Um, and the other center is called the Center for Social Wellbeing and Development. I know that sounds very fatuous, so I apologize in advance for the fatuous name. Uh, and we do mostly global work. Um, a, lot, a lot of it has been with UNICEF in sort of promoting a, a broad social, ecological, holistic perspective for addressing um, human rights and health issues. And now we move to Sarah. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I am also middle-aged <laughs> white. I have to be female. Um, when Eric uh, sent out the email and said that this panel had been approved. He wasn't sure at first that I guess it would get accepted in terms of our uh, timeline and and the format for this meeting. I was like, I'm not sure what I can contribute uh, and was a little hesitant to be on here. I am an environmental anthropologist, a development uh, specialist, um, work a lot in human rights and environmental justice issues and several different places in the world. This photo is from Matabele and Zimbabwe. And uh, so do address 
sort of the disenfranchisement of vulnerable populations in general who are oftentimes quote unquote invisible. Uh, on a personal note, I think part of what kept me on this panel was that um, my family of procreation is all black. So I've married someone from West Africa. Uh, our children are mixed race, but of course, not of course, but in the U.S. are regarded largely as black, though they would self-identify as mixed. We have lived in places in the world where our mixed race families is seemingly uh, negligible, and we have lived uh, a lot of our family life, not all of it, but a lot of it in Texas where it's not negligible. And so I have some experiences being a mother of a mixed race slash black children who are now grown and adults and have their own opinions. But, um, uh, you know, I don't know what that means exactly in terms of this panel, uh, but um, also provides me some perhaps emotional background, etc. That could be could be something worth sharing. We'll see, right? How it goes. So thank you for talking me into saying. Well, well, thank you, Sarah. You're quite persuasive. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you, Sarah. I truly appreciate uh, uh, your participation, and uh, and again, uh, our stories are very diverse and yet unique. And I think it's so important to share uh, a lot more of our stories because each and every one of us have a certain uh, perspective to bring to uh, this issue. Now, um, I want to start defining the concepts. Like I said, I want to define them because here, uh, uh, a little bit more description about myself. I've been teaching I, 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 at East Carolina University. I've been teaching a, a race and ethnic relations class for the past uh, five years officially, but I've been teaching uh, um, community oriented or uh, particular ethnic classes for the past 30 years at different universities. But during the past five years, I recognize that my students, and I really want to uh, provide this framework, my students are so galvanized about issues of racism and injustice, and it, they come across it every day, but they have a problem of talking about it and, and providing and getting some solutions, some strategies. And matter of fact, this semester I'm teaching a race and ethnic relations class uh, online. I used to teach it face to face, and now it's all online. And I'm getting even more discussion and emotion from my students on these issues. And one of the major things that's coming out, they and I recognize they need a framework for all of these things that are happening. So I'm going to provide the definition that I use for my class. And I not only teach the race and ethnic relations class, I teach my uh, set of graduate classes uh, for my I'm a joint appointed professor. I'm in anthropology and public health. So I have my other classes in the ethnic and rural health disparities graduate uh, certificate program that I teach. And the, the classes that I teach there are ethnic health and health disparities, African American health, uh, capstone experience in ethnic health and health disparities, and global public health. And we go through these issues again and again. I've been teaching these classes here at East Carolina University for the past 15 years. But particularly in my race and ethnic relations class, uh, I, I like to start off with definitions and frame it out. Because everyone uses the words, but they seldom slow down and define them. And it's so important to get new definitions because these definitions change. For example, I define racism, and everyone has a different way of defining these issues. Racism as I define it for my class and how I frame it out for my students and particularly uh, for this audience, for uh, uh, those who are coming in, racism is defined as a belief that a race is the primary determinant of human traits and, cap and capacities and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. There is uh, three 
three levels, and I say, and this really shakes up the students when I just start defining things out, and uh, and they are kind of surprised. As well as that's the general definition of racism, but there's also a definition of scientific. Uh, what I bring up, scientific racialism that has been promoted for decades and centuries. And that scientific ra racialism is an academic, uh, based in academic discipline. It's based upon an ideology or doctrine, set of beliefs, suggesting that races exist and that there are significant differences among them. And therefore, this ideology causes or promotes superiority from one race to another. Certain races are more superior and the other races are inferior. With that, and all disciplines have struggled with this issues of racism in the academic context because it has, previous time has been promoted in different ways. Then when we break down racism, when I break down racism for the class, there's three levels of racism. One is institutionalized racism. This manifests itself both in material conditions and in access to power. Again, it manifests itself in material conditions and access to power. That is very important to recognize. Material conditions and access to power. That is differential access to different uh Healthcare facilities, different differential access to education, income, all across the board. So there's institutionalized racism. Number two, personally mediated racism. That is assumptions about other groups and actions against others. And that's where we unfortunately talk about issues of prejudice and discrimination. So there's personally mediated racism directed towards a particular group, another group. And then third, internalized racism. This is the acceptance of members of the stigmatized, stigmatized races of negative messages about their own abilities and intrinsic worth, characterizing by, um, by their not, not believing in themselves and not uh, belonging to any other groups. So they, this is internalized racism where it's, again, the acceptance of members of that stigmatized race of negative messages and about their own ability. So when I break this out of racism, institutionalized, personally mediated, and internalized, my students and the, uh, they start to better understand, okay, this is what really is happening. If there's an event, unfortunately, happening in, the, uh, in our world or uh, in our state they start to frame it out this is institutionalized racism or this example is personally mediated directly or this is internalized now when i bring up internalized a lot of uh, my students of color they they recognize that is a big bigging a uh, bigger and growing issue within various groups that have been stigmatized and we don't slow down enough to look at how internalized racism has unfortunately caused many groups, many individuals to not mm, take, uh, uh, advance their career for whatever reason because they have unfortunately bought into the way societies have put down various groups. And we have a very, very lively lively discussion about internalized racism and and you can just see it's a it's it just shocks everyone that they've held themselves back in so many different capacities and uh so i spent a lot i do a lot of different exercises of that and i'm just kind of curious you know when we start breaking out these issues is it interpreted differently not just in our country but in other countries are there identified institutionalized racism in other countries that they identify? Are there personally still personally mediated? Because many times when we think about personally mediated, we think of, uh, my students think of it uh, in the past, but unfortunately, even obviously today in 
today's climate, we can see there's unfortunately personally mediated racism even today with the latest incidents happening in our country directed towards various groups. And then there's internalized racism. So those three components help me really push a, a lot of the uh, issues in my class and uh, as well as I have an exercise that I give students. Uh, oh, here's another exercise that I give students. Uh, and I think this is very relevant to, to our discussion. Uh, I, I have my students take a selfie of themselves, but also take a, a selfie with a friend who doesn't look like you. Doesn't look like you is a different racial and ethnic background. And we post it on, on, the, on, our, on our class uh, canvas. And most students, and, and I ask them, what do you think is a race or, uh, racial or ethnic background of that student that you posted? And many times they will give their visual appearance, visual interpretation of that, uh, of that student. But nine times out of ten, they get it wrong when they see a person visibly and they try. We Normally, we place individuals in categories based upon how people look their skin color, their their height, their hair, whatever. And my students, nine times out of ten, get it wrong of what the person, who their what their ethnicity really is. And they're just shocked of how diverse, even here on at my campus, DCU, how diverse and how ethnically diverse our student population is, and they are surprised of their groupings, uh, how far they can go. And they acknowledge their own ethnocentrism. And that's one of the keys in moving down this dialogue of racism and social injustice. We have to acknowledge our own biases and our own misinterpretations. And I say right up front to my class and to everyone, I come with a certain biases and beliefs based upon who I am. And just like we described ourselves in, in this session, how we describe ourselves, and I think it's you know, uh, and I think it's fascinating how we have to describe ourselves. I describe myself as African American, brown skin, uh, you know, middle aged, baby boomer, and all of this. But those, that, just by doing that, I'm just going to say this: just by doing this, we put ourselves in a category. And. From my perspective, we shouldn't put ourselves in a category just based upon how we look. Because what we see is not what, uh, it doesn't obviously uh, show the entire culture and the background of individuals. So, and I tell my students, stop putting yourselves in a box. We do it on a regular basis because we have to. And, some, and most of the times I say, Please don't put yourself in a box because guess what? That is kind of like internal internalized racism. It, it, it puts my students in a box and therefore they do not, well not do not, but sometimes, sometimes they don't put the extra effort when they put themselves in a box. And I said, society already puts us in a box. So be very, very cautious of how we, how you put yourself in a box. And so I tried to step our students, my, my students, and but particularly for this audience uh, uh, listening, I, I, I would encourage encourage us to uh, get a different perspective. And my final uh, introductory or overview remark is that I took a uh, uh, class over uh, to uh, England and Aust Austria, uh, and to Vienna, Austria, three years ago on a global uh, global of public health um, study abroad and my students uh, were surprised of how the healthcare system is in those two particular countries and we had great informants in both countries and when our, those informants in England and also in uh, Austria started to share more of the history and some of the structure of healthcare and medicine and some of the social injustice issues that they're uh, affiliated with, my students were surprised, shocked. And they thought uh, 
there wasn't enough attention to a lot of the social injustice issues in those countries. And I encourage my students to say, we see things in a Western perspective, in an American perspective, when we're looking at issues of social injustice and racism in another country. And I said, let's try to see it from their perspective. Let's slow down. Let's not be as critical up front until we learn much more about the history, the culture, and the people, uh, and a and lot more of the factors involved before rushing to judgment. And that's one of the keys before we rush to judgment on a lot of these issues. And then finally, what I do in my, my current class, I have students debate about some of these issues that are that have been identified as a, a racial conflict. And they are surprised of what their final decision is when they actually debate it. I divide the class up into those who are pro for issue and then those who are against the issue. And then I have a select jury of students. And that jury of students decide whether an issue that is seems apparent that's racially motivated sometimes is completely different of how they come up with a decision. Or, or if a decision is not as based upon another issue, my students come up with that that was racially motivated. They decide upon that. And it goes and it goes against the grain. So again, the reason why I, I like to break these things down and walk individuals through, but also the fun, the other step is how can we as applied anthropologists develop strategies so the next generation can get a better framework on these things and better define it, better come, uh, come up with better solutions because the solutions are there. Many, let me just say this, many of my students are just so scared, so hesitant to share their point of view when you go down this road. Uh, it's amazing, but when you give them the opportunity, there's so many new solutions. So again, I want to bring that up uh, to our uh, to our round table, and uh, now I'm going to uh, throw it over to Joe uh, to because he, uh, he I want him to bring up uh, issues of xenophobia because he was talking about that, and, as well as the issues on the on the border and where he's currently lo where he's located. So does that make sense of how you know I provided a framework in some of these issues of how we can feed off of those issues. Oh yeah, thank you, thank you, Eric. It's a it's a it's a great start and an inspiring set of ideas and examples. Um, I, I'm located. Uh, my university is right behind me uh, at the U.S. Mexico border, um, and that is a a place where we have an opportunity to. Um, do some of this uh, comparative perspectives on racism, racism in the Americas. And the Americas do ha share some foundational events. Um, the conquest of the indigenous peoples of the Americas after Columbus and the uh, uh, enslavement of uh, Africans, um, other uh, movements of populations and in conditions of servitude, such as Asians being moved to the, the Americas. And so, uh, a, 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 as notably uh, worked into the very fabric of the social relations and culture of the Americas. But there are also important differences in the border. The U.S.-Mexico border is an important place to observe these differences. And, and I'll, I'll say uh, the, a, a principal difference, and then I'll go into the question of uh, migration across the border and racism. Um, in This is well known to Latin Americanists, um, and an important theme in, actually in the history of anthropological thought about race. Um, there's a, the racial framework in the United States is uh, what's sometimes been called the one drop rule. I, I think that's actually immigration is eroding that and mixed status, uh, mixed, uh, pardon me, mixed ancestry people are eroding that. Um, but it's, it's still very, very strong. 
And that, that is the one drop rule is that, that uh, people in the United States, whenever they know somebody has uh, African-American ancestry to any amount, either it's phenotypically visible or they simply know the person's social background, it's always the position to move them into the African-American category. That's one drop rule. The, the, in Latin America, you have a much more uh, flexible uh, racial system uh, that's very much influenced by class. Um, so famously, so, uh, 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 money whitens in Latin America, although that can be overstated because there's continuing racism even for people who are, who are, who are wealthy. Um, but nevertheless, there's a, there's a great deal of flexibility, and it has to do with a subtle set of uh, social judgments. People have oftentimes sort of, in Latin America, there's a, a favorite myth, which is that race doesn't exist. Because of this flexibility, um, and compared to North America, but Latin America can be incredibly racist. Um, and it's racist in, in subtle ways that, that have different, as we shouldn't be surprised as anthropologists, different cultural codings, such as uh, uh, in, 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 in Mexico, people sometimes will be referred to as mal educado, um, poorly, impolite, poorly educated, and so forth, which can be a code for being either dark or poor or both. Um, so... So, or, or, or that they, they, they lack culture. So there's still the usage of the term culture as a kind of a, a signifier, a rank signifier. Okay, at the U.S.-Mexico border, of course, we have this interface and people move from Mexico into the United States are moving from this, this, this flexible but still very unequal racist society in Mexico, where you have uh, uh, mostly people of indigenous ancestry and people of European ancestry, and an immense range of combinations of those twos. There's a fair amount of African ancestry in Mexico too, but it's mostly mixed into the population, except for a couple of regional uh, areas, um, small regional areas. And, um, that, that people move across the border and they're reinterpreted as a race in the United States, which is um, oftentimes called Mexican. And people in the United States will often call Latin Americans Mexicans. And that's significant to Donald Trump. Um, that's very unfair to every other person in Latin America who's not a Mexican and may in fact hold Mexico at some arm's length. Um, but that's uh, very, very quickly gets recategorized that way. A good example at the, in El Paso is that uh, people of uh, Mexican ancestry are called Mexican. Like if you, you know, they may, their family may have come to the United States 200 years ago, but you <laughs> ask what they are and they'll say Mexican. Okay, and then go through, if it, it still needs to be clarified, go through some lengthy explanation of being in the United States. So which side are you from? Oh, I'm from this side. You know, I'm a Mexican from this side, not a Mexican from the other side of the border. So this is relevant because we're now entering into a period of anti-immigrant xenophobia. It's, a, it's not that there's never been anti-immigrant xenophobia in the past, but it's a period of renewed xenophobia. And for that matter, it's always important to remember a period of renewed resistance to xenophobia and of of integration and transformation in the United States. These two things go together. Xenophobia, in, in some important ways, is a reaction against them, the, the integration processes. And um, in, right immediately intervening in the middle of this is, is the figure of Donald Trump, who finds it, who was a racist, I mean, he's a long history as a racist in New York City, and but finds it politically useful to say Mexicans are rapists and, and they're bad people. And it, it's a perfect example of the fact that he's not making any distinction among any you know, group of immigrants. The Mexicans become the icon of, of, of bad people who are invading 
the United States, and there's good anthropology of all of this, this whole symbolic process of invasion. And he promises to create a wall which will block everything off. And, and that is, uh, 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 I think that there is definitely a, a transformation of U.S. racism in which uh, anti-African American racism is a very powerful thing and absolutely still exists, but has in some instances has become reworked as uh, immigration xenophobia, in part because that works well. This, the immigrants are outsiders. African Americans are clearly English speaking Americans and have been in the military. And the civil rights movement has put you know them has has put their inclusion. Uh, out in the American consciousness, and it's, it's, it certainly still happens, but it's harder to admit overt racism in the contemporary United States against African Americans, but it's easier to dismiss these immigrants as outsiders. I'm not trying to create divisions there, but I think this is a real historical process. It's not an accident that uh, 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 Jeff Sessions, the former senator from Alabama, made his mark in the Senate first as a Southern segregationist senator, and then as an anti-immigrant senator, and that, that he had as a chief of staff, uh, Stephen Miller, who is the main architect of Trump's anti-immigrant measures at the border. Now, I'm not going to go through everything that was done at the border. That's a lengthy narrative. But uh, this intersects with the racism in Mexico. Most of the people who are who are now immigrating across the U.S.-Mexico border. There are some Mexicans who are moving here, but most of the people who are immigrating across the border are actually non-Mexicans. Mexico has become a country of transit. It's very ironic that Donald Trump would proclaim that we're being invaded by Mexicans at a time when Mexican migration has dropped way off. And instead, you're getting people from the so-called Northern Triangle of Central America, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, and also people transiting from the rest of the world, where we get a, a, a small but significant number of African uh, asylum seekers at the U.S.-Mexico border, Cameroon, Uganda, uh, Congo. We get a number of uh, Haitians uh, at the U.S.-Mexico border, um, and people from other parts of the world. So the Mexicans themselves are who have a substantial amount of skin color racism in their cultural framework, but which is also not usually expressed very openly. It's expressed in a subtle way in terms of judgments about kinds of Mexicans are now confronted with uh, a movement of um, non-Mexicans Many of them Central Americans. Many Central Americans are indigenous. If they're coming from uh, Guatemala, especially. Um, another significant segment of Central Americans are people from the Caribbean coast of Honduras, which is a fairly Afro-descended region. Yes. Although Hondureños might not perceive them as being... I mean, they're Hondureños to Hondurans, but to then they get into Mexico and suddenly they're these very African-looking people. Um, there's some Cubans coming through Mexico, um, and uh, there are there's a group called the Garifuna who are arriving at the border in small numbers, but but real numbers. And the Garifuna are uh, indigenous Native American people who have became phenotypically mostly African, um, and so forth. Um, so. So and Mexicans themselves, uh, as they wrestle with this phenomenon of becoming a country of passage of transmigration, and in a situation where the U.S. government is manipulating the Mexican government, coercing it because the Mexican government is so weak compared to the United States, manipulating them into doing U.S. immigration policy bidding, the Mexicans themselves are bringing out this, this debate about race. Um, and where Central Americans are classified as indigenous, worse indigenous people. And one other thing to add there, and then I'll finish, which is that the, the people who are now 
migrating from Mexico or migrating at all from all kinds of places because of organized crime violence across Mexico. And it is ethnically varied internally, regionally varied in Mexico. But an important source region is the Guerrero, which is um, significantly indigenous folks on the coast, somewhat African descended. Uh, Oaxaca, which is indigenous. Uh, Chiapas, which is indigenous. Uh, Puebla, which is the southern parts of which are indigenous. Um, so we're getting Michoacan, which is indigenous. And we're getting more and more Mexicans who fit the Mexican racist, that the unspoken but real Mexican racist stereotype of uh, brown, uh, undesirable, lower groups of people. So there's a, a Mexico is kind of caught in this um, internal debate over over race. I will say, and I don't, uh, I'm not an expert on it. And I don't have, you know, uh, time either. But there there are important movements of race consciousness and racial justice in Latin America. Um, not as much as one would hope in Mexico. I think there are important movements in other countries, and 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 that's uh, something that is um, represents a real opening up of the door in Latin American societies. So, I'm, I'm not sure who's next, but somebody should. Do. That was great. That was great, Joe. <laughs> if, I, I want to ask some follow up questions to you a little bit later. Yeah, yeah. If it's okay. Um, yeah. If, uh, Mary, don't mind if I if I jump in just with uh, just a few anecdotes, and then I just want to add another little twist to your um, your your multiple levels and layers in terms of a, of a definition. And um, yeah, in, in Mexico, the border area is of course it's it's very interesting. And in Mexico, there's this, this idealized category of the mestizo. You know, this is it's a mestizo country, but in fact, there are all these. These nuances, and at, at, at one point, this is a wait ways back. I was uh, looking at narco corridos, which are narratives of, uh, you know, there, there. It's a, a pop music genre, and narratives of drug traffickers, exploits of drug traffickers, and um, and many of the drug traffickers are, you know, come from not necessarily indigenous, but sort of. Um, uh, you know, there, there's a class issue there for many of them, where you know this has been a route to to power, and and so there there was an element of in some of these songs that are, you know, extolling the virtues of narco traffickers and exploits and so on and so forth. There there was definitely a an element in some of them, you know, contesting that the the subtle racial narrative that that happens in Mexico and and when I was I was actually in El Paso for for a while doing some of of this um, um, and in Juarez, you know, I spent a lot of time in Juarez and then other parts of the border all the way to, to Los Angeles where I actually interviewed some people who were in the these small recording studios recorded some of these um, narco corridos. Um, at that point, uh, there had been one of sort of the original hero uh, narco corrido singers was Chalino Sanchez and uh, he's still idolized in many, in many, uh, in many ways and um, I interviewed sometimes radio, and this was in El Paso. I interviewed um, radio broadcasters, some who broadcasted those those songs, and some who did not. And it was interesting the ones who did not. Um, they they really really looked down their nose at Chalino Sanchez, calling his his voice as you know in reference to what you were talking about, Joe. Uh, you know, sort of mal educado. You know, he was he was uneducated. He had a whiny, thin, reedy country voice. And on the other side, people, one of the reasons people sort of idolized him was that he basically threw that out in the face of, of listeners and said, yeah, that's who I am. And, you know, eh, okay, you know, whatever. Um, and so, you know, there was this contestation that was going on, even in those, you know, narco corridos that had to do with some of these, these subtle categories of, 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 um, of race. And, um, and, you know, and, just another quick anecdote. I, I have done a lot of work in Bay East where there's, you know, a, a substantial Garifuna population in the south, in the south coastal area, particularly same, you know, area on the map that, you know, in the, the part of Honduras where, um, where the Garifuna are. And, um, you know, it's interesting how the Garifuna are 
there is a very interesting, subtle racialization of the Garifuna within a political hierarchy that is or has been dominated by Afro-Caribbean, English-speaking Afro-Caribbean, um, you know, sort of post-colonial, it was the post-colonial power structure left over from British colonialism in, in what was once British Honduras. So um, the Garifuna are, the, you know, especially when I first worked there, the HIV rates and other things were much higher among the Garifuna because they were, they were shut out of a lot of, you know, kind of the economic and sort of paths to power through private schools and other things like that. Um, and, um, and, you know, even though in the tourist, the tourist literature from, from Belize, that, you know, Garifuna music and Garifuna culture was sort of held up as prototypical, you know, Belizean culture. In reality, there was a lot of exclusion and subtle kind of internal racism against the Garifuna, who are, you know, a historical mix of African and Caribbean um, populations that are a direct result of slavery and colonialism. And so the, these stories, I mean, I think, you know, as anthropologists, one of the, certainly one of the things we can bring to the table is, is you know, trying to illuminate the, you know, the, the nuances and the subtlety of, of racism. Um, that occurs in so many directions. And, you know, I want to, you know, add, and this is a very crude way of categorizing things, but you can also think of, you know, sort of vertical and horizontal racism in a way, you know, uh, vertical racism being, you know, that, that the racism that's directly associated with a white, non-white, you know, power hierarchy and, um, you know, has all the dimensions that Eric talked about, the institutionalized racism, so on and so forth, the internalized racism, and, and, and et cetera, historical, historically situated, you know, racism like that, that is, you know, vertical in that nature. And then there's also this, you know, you could say something like a, a, a horizontal racism between oppressed groups or non-white groups within this, this broader, you know, vertical framework. So, you know, you have, I mean, in the communities that we work with, the immigrant communities, even the Latino immigrant communities that we work with around the Washington, D.C. area, for example, I mean, there are Dominicans, for example, who are Afro-Latino. Um, and there are, you know, Salvadorans, Guatemalans, uh, you know, Hondurans, and then there are also people, some people from Andean Latin America, you know, in, in, in Peru and in Bolivia. And so there, there are... There are absolutely distinctions that go on, even among youth, because we, at one point, we were working on some youth violence prevention related, you know, efforts in, in this community. And, and you know, the interaction between the Dominicans and the Salvadorans was palpable. And, you know, the, the, the combination of, um, you know, racialization and, and racial comments, you know, between those two groups and, on the other hand, the, the, the immigrant narrative because, you know, the Dominicans uh, for the most part were not um, recent migrants and, you know, there, there were much fewer questions related to documentation and so, so on among the, the Dominicans so some of the Salvadorans would complain that the Dominicans looked down at them because they were you know, they were, you know, undocumented and so on and so forth and so these, these battles between gang cliques and factions in the school you know, um, included all these these, these very nuanced and still do, you know, these nuanced, uh, 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 you know, racialized and immigrant and, you know, sub-ethnic categories, uh, you know, that, 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 that populate this. And then, you know, included in that, you know, you have let's, racism between Asian, different Asian populations and uh, Latinos or African Americans. And, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And I'm, I'm, I'm including Asian, the category Asian here broadly. I mean, these categories are all ridiculous, as we know. I mean, you know, Asian, what does Asian mean? I mean, Asian means anything from Pakistani to Vietnamese. Um, so, you know, there is, that's something that, you know, again, these are, it's a sort of a crude way of categorizing things, but thinking about sort of that, the vertical racism associated with the power heart and the horizontal racism associated with, you know, racism between groups who are oppressed. And, and, um, and this is, I mean, we certainly saw that in the election, in the recent election, where, you know, people talked about the Latin or the Latinx quote, and it was, you know, segmented. 
different in Florida, different in parts of Texas than in other places. And, um, and some of that had to do with, you know, internal characterizations of, of migrant, non-migrant and, you know, wow, in Texas and, and, and moving north to, to Colorado, you have the, you know, you have the, 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 the their various names that Hispano populations who even look at themselves as Spanish and not Mexican, you know, because they came up with the original, you know, um, um, Spanish uh, um, armies, you know, moving north, and, and they differentiate, differentiate, uh, differentiate themselves from uh, from other Latino categories like that. So it's, it's all these, these subtle categories are are, are very are, are very important and. You know, certainly, I remember one project I had with the U.S. Office of Minority Health when we were looking at um, access to care uh, in, in, in different clinics. And um, I was in this clinic in Wichita, and there's a, there's a whole migration stream going up through Wichita to Chicago. You know, it's, it's a historical Mexican um, migration path up to the, the you know, beginning way back with the meat processing and other plants in Chicago. And... and um, you know, there were all these reports. So we did interviews with with uh, clients of these clinics, of these public health clinics, and and, uh, and and staff, and so on and so forth. And there was some initial conversations about, you know, discrimination against, you know, these recent migrants coming up. Um, and, you know, the immediate assumption is that it was discrimination by, you know, white or Euro-American medical practitioners or doctors against against Latinos as a broad category. Um, but that, that wasn't the case, actually. In this case, it was, it was uh, a lot of the reports were discrimination by Latino staff against recent migrants. Um, because a lot, some of these, some of the staff were, you know, lighter skinned, lighter skinned Latinos, let's say from Andean countries who maybe even had a medical degree. Or, you know, so there was the class issue there. Um, and, you know, here maybe they didn't have a license and they were working as a health educator or, you know, at some other staff position in the clinic and they were really resentful and did not like, you know, the migrants who were coming from El Salvador or who were coming from, you know, Guatemala and didn't speak English and, you know, and were, were categorized in all these things. So, you know, this, these are things that as an anthropologist we can really point out these, these constructed, historically situated uh, symbolic categories that are manipulated and used for, you know, for all sorts of reasons of, you know, power jostling and, and uh, you know, and in any number of ways. So, um, and that, you know, and, and just remembering that, you know, these are historically situated categories and the use of them is historically situated. So, yes, in the U.S., it's, it's different in the U.S. because we have you know, such a deeply embedded slave history that, that became such a part of the institution and the growth and the, the birth, growth, and expansion of the U.S. Um, whereas in other places, it's a little more, you know, nuanced. Again, in the Caribbean, boy, the Caribbean is so fascinating in this way because you've got those multiple categories of the various layers of, of, of indigenous Indian, African slaves, you know, um, South Asian indentured servants and all these other things, that, and, and these are populated and mixed into you know to multiple category systems in the in the in the Caribbean. So, um, so anyway, those are just you know some thoughts there. Uh, excellent. I mean, that brings up a a lot of compelling issues of of the subtleties and uh, uh, within groups, and, and that's what I really appreciate how you uh, how you brought it up from one place to another. Uh, and, and so that's uh, that brings us to uh, some of the issues that Sarah uh, brought up. Uh, Sarah mentioned in her opening uh, discussion uh, of herself uh, about her own experiences. And I don't know if uh, Sarah is uh, ready to um, elaborate upon any of the issues that uh, Joe or uh, Mark brought up. Sarah's still there. Sarah, you're muted. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let me say a couple comments. Because I've also spent, um, I guess oddly enough, our panel has spent a fair amount of time doing research in Belize. And some of my early training was in Honduras, southern and northern Honduras. Um, 
And one of my experiences in Honduras, in both places, honestly, uh, and you've alluded to it, uh, Mark, I believe, is that um, one of the one of the characteristics that I found that I have found that people uh, acknowledge is skin tone, regardless of whether you're Griffin or Mestizo, Maya, whatever you are. If you're in Belize and you're out on the street and it's a Saturday and the sun is out, uh, how many women are going to be walking around with umbrellas? Uh, why are they doing that? They're walking around with umbrellas because they want as light a skin tone as they can possibly have. Um, right, Mark? You're yep. Oh, yeah. I've seen that in lots of places. Yeah, and I don't think the men are doing that. Check me. Maybe I'm wrong, but the men are not doing that. But the women are definitely doing that. And in Honduras, I had an incident. This is quite early. I was actually engaged to my now husband. And I was in a, a uh, farming village in the south. It was fairly remote. So, you know, not everything gets to those places. This is a excuse me, the early 1980s, just to give you a time frame. And my little mom, I called her my mama Cita, you know, I was living, was gabbing in the evening, and she was asking me some questions, and, and it came up that, yes, I had a boyfriend, and she, like, jumped on that, right? And who is this, and, you know, what did you do, and blah, 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 blah. And I, you know, I had been in the north, along the northern coast, uh, also in Honduras, and had seen the uh, attitudes there among the, um, you know, the Afro-Caribs, etc., and also just lighter skin tone is better, lighter skin tone is better. And so I hesitated to tell her about my, you know, my fiancé, and uh, I reluctantly did. I said, well, he's from Africa, and she sort of looked at me. She says, well, is he black? And I said, well, yes, he is, and immediately, feo, feo, feo came out of her mouth, you know? And I was like, oh, great, you know, and uh, so I was trying to save myself because I adored this woman. And I said, but he's wealthy and he's going to school. He's going to have, you know, a really good future. And she goes, oh, okay. You know, so I'm not saying that's representative of absolutely anything except that, that I've found at least in those two countries, um, and I've spent much more time in Belize, that there is also this light of the skin tone preference. Uh, I don't know how that sort of translates in terms of all the different, you know, technically, if I'm not wrong, there's 14 different ethnic groups in Belize, so I'm not sure. And there's a lot of mestizos, and there's a lot of, one thing there's a lot more of, too, is um, less endogamous marriage among, among those ethnic groups, and much more uh, mixed marriages. And so I think over time, how is that going to uh, influence that situation. But I had something else I wanted to share, if I could. I, can, I had it up here on my screen. Hold on just a second. Sorry. Here it is. Can I switch gears a little? Is that okay with sure, you? Sure, sure. That's okay. fine. Please go ahead. I mean, again, this is an open, informal. Go, go right so ahead. This, this is really addressing what you were talking about in terms of internalized racism. And it came up with me and a colleague of mine, uh, Baylor, uh, because he is Asian American. And I was talking with him a few days ago about the Atlanta shooting. And I had also seen on Facebook one of his posts, which was from an article um, called The Atlanta Shootings Have Awakened a Ferocious Anger and Grief Among Asian Americans. And if you'll permit me, I want to read just a really short quote from that article. Uh, as an Asian American woman, woman, sorry, I understand what it means to be invisible. Many factors contribute to the social, cultural, and political invisibility of Asians in America, but our own narrative remains in our control. We need to be done proving ourselves as worthy immigrants. Our culture of shame, saving face, protecting the greater good, has led to a culture of secrecy and detrimental internalization. Similarly, the culture of sexism, racism, colorism, and classism within the Asian community erodes us and harms those outside our community. Changing both of these things will be integral, integral sorry, for us to heal as a community and reach a point of greater justice. And so I was talking with him about, you know, um, we were talking about how, of course, 
these shootings are kind of a whole different deal, right? You don't necessarily want to separate them out. Uh, and I'm not also not an expert on mass shootings. But um, when events such as that or other kinds of events that you've been talking about occur, we, at least in the U.S., I believe, tend to be largely, but you can argue me, a reactive society. We react in that moment. We're not necessarily proactive. And I do believe in terms of your different, the way you've broken out racism, you know, it's very difficult to solve it all in one, one piece, right? But I think in terms of this particular internalized racism, that, at, well, in all of these, there's long and short term uh, views that we must consider. And there's both proactive and and perhaps in the case of the immediate event, there's the reactive, you know? I'd like to get away from even having to have these events to where we have to be reactive, right? Um, so for me, and then there's the, the, what can we do now? Because something, we can't just, I mean, one of my, one of the things I've always believed in, and I'm sure all of you have too, is you know, this really needs to start in our young childhood as we grow up in our enculturation. And, and what we're taught, I mean, this quote demonstrates that, you know, this culture of shame. I mean, you know, can you not, is there a way to, either through education systems and or as young children and or in families, um, you know, be conscious of that in terms of adults who then need to address it. Um, but also through the education system, I do believe we, you know, we can we can do that. We can do it in other countries. I've seen it in Niger, where my husband is from, um, where the situation is a little different. But um, so I think we can be. I mean, we we're all working in all these different areas. There's not, you know, there may be more or less coordination of effort. And so that's one of the things I think you were asking, Eric, you know, what can anthropologists, why anthropologists do, basically, to, to forward some goodness in all of these, you know, addressing all of these. And, of course, I, I, don't, I think the big picture, you know, that's just sort of overwhelming to me. But to take pieces and work on them and then have some, some level of coordination. And if we, if we, I'm not volunteering to do this, but if there was an inventory of, hey, who has worked in, you know, as an advocate for any kind of, um, any kind of improvement in education, uh, educational systems, let's just say for purposes of argument here, K through 12. Boy, in this particular type of racism internally, you have got to start early. But at the same time, you can't only start early because it's going on right now. So we have to have, I think, we have to think in both the short term and the long term. And for me, the long term might be easier to devise strategies, not necessarily easier to come up with uh, the support for those and to get them done. But the short term, I think, I call it short term. I don't know exactly what that means, you know. By the time my adult children are my age, you know, 20 years or something, a couple generations, you know, can we not see a different America and or a different world? that doesn't have this level of racism exhibited because, just because, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm tired of it. I don't want to, you know, I have a grandson who, who asked why the police would kill his father because he's black. You know, that question just breaks my heart. And I, I don't want to hear that question again from him, honestly. Um, this is a little food for thought, I guess it's kind of where I am right now. But I see some parallels there with the vertical and the horizontal, you know, the reactive, the proactive, the short term, the long term. I think those are all somehow have to be organized and maybe coordinated. We also don't want to not reinvent the wheel, but we also want to coordinate such so that we aren't, um, we're being efficient and effective with our efforts, right? We don't want to have people doing the same thing in the same place and nobody's doing anything in another place or with another issue. I don't know. Does that make sense?
Very that much so. quote yeah. did speak to me. I just, I read it, I've read it, I don't know, 10 times in the last week. Just going, oh my goodness. Um, so I wanted to share it with you. My wife, by the way, is from Southeast Asia. And she's scared. And she's uh-huh. very, my daughter's scared to death to drive in Texas. <laughs> Anywhere. Be stopped by a police. She's scared to death. Frozen. And she's 30. She's not a child. Not Again, Sarah, you bring up some great points of uh, we're a react reactive society, and uh, that is, and then being a reactive society, we get frustrated. And I'm, I'm really glad that you broke out the you divided long term and short term strategies because that's where my students feel very frustrated when these events happen, and they don't feel like they can do anything about them, about these different events that happen. Seem like, unfortunately, the past year, we've seen so many different events, and uh, particularly in the African American community, the the death of very much so of individuals in so many different communities, and that galvanized people, and they feel completely frustrated when these events happen in the in the present. And they want to do something, but they don't know exactly where to do something constructive. So I really like the way you indicated there's long-term and short-term strategies. And if we can see certain, start with uh, short-term strategies, a lot of us, uh, whether whatever age, we can start to see some progress. Because we, unfortunately, in this day and time, uh, and I tell my students, um, next year, we're unfortunately going to be talking about another event and another event in my class. And they, I know they truly do want to see some type of progress. And who is going to take the lead to address some of these short-term, and of course there's long-term issues, but really short-term strategies to counteract blatant racism, to counteract uh, these events that are happening to specific groups in our society and other societies. So uh, I can feel that frustration from my students. I can hear it from, you know, from yourself and also from, you know, uh, we care for our, our kids. I got three kids and, uh, and I'm very much concerned about their, uh, their lives because I got two, two sons and a daughter and uh, they live in different states. Well, two of them live in uh, uh, another this state, but they were in different states. So, I'm really thinking about their safety, and I shouldn't have to, at the age of 62 that I am, I shouldn't have to worry about the, my professional kids at this stage, but I am very much concerned about their safety, because they're persons of color, and I can control, We, my wife and I, we, we raised our kids a certain way, and we want them to take full advantage of their educational opportunities, but we we still are very much uh, um, concerned about their welfare, and even though they, they've empowered themselves with their education. But again, it's that other element in society. And unfortunately, you bring it up, uh, a skin tone. And my kids, uh, and I tell them this, that no matter what your skin tone is, uh, you're, you're brown, and people want to perceive you differently. And not just other groups, but even within our African American, my African American community, they see our kids differently, uh, depending upon where they're at. So, again, I think it's very productive to have the discussion, but to take it another uh, uh, challenge, each and every one of you right now, what, what do you perceive are certain strategies that we can do in the short term for for those who are viewing this uh, session, what concrete strategies that they can take away from our session and say, here's a, how an anthropologist can, uh, uh, and we are applied anthropologists, so how can we work with other organizations that are working with race relations issues, whether it's education, whether it's in border control, with, uh, Joe brought up the issues of border control, Mark, you brought up the great issue of uh, horizontal racism, vertical racism, and your experiences, what concrete strategies, small strategies, can 
you know, we be involved with. So other uh, potentially new anthropo- applied anthropologists can can you know see uh, uh, an opportunity to help uh, on these issues of short term strategies and even long term strategies. Because I, I consider institutionalized racism as a long term strategy to address. But if we address the short term strategies, like personally mediated strategies of how people go against each other because of who they are, uh, and then also address the internalized. Uh, those are some types of uh, short-term strategies. So uh, I'm going to ask Joe, uh, can you uh, start um, you know, perhaps addressing some of the strategies that you and other applied anthropologists can, can uh, show to others of how we're, we're taking strides, we're at least taking strides to, to address this issue? Right. I, I mean, it, it, you know, I think that it's worth thinking about ways that we can uh, have uh, uh, a cross-border or transnational uh, strategies against racism. Um, the United States is in an unusual uh, position in this in that it, it uh, is still uh, the kind of a dominant cultural leader in the world system. I don't mean to necessarily endorse that or say that everything happens in the rest of the world in the wake of the United States. But you see this, I just recently read an article about um, reactionary French intellectuals blaming the United States for the rise of anti-racist movements and concerns with policing and so forth in France. And I thought, well, what a great thing. That's, that's, a, that's a good export. Um, and I know the case of Brazil is similar. And um, and so I think there are opportunities to do this kind of thing. I mean, in a very practical way, it is possible to create forums. Uh, more people are using this kind of electronic communication. And even after COVID-19, we, you know, I, I hope that some of the lessons of doing things across uh, great distances can be uh, solved and figuring out how to navigate time zones. Um, seeking small amounts of money for simultaneous interpretation. Uh, which I have, uh, you know, found to be a valuable um, activity. Um, And so in a very practical way that's appropriate to the SFAA, thinking about how to build uh, cross-border initiatives in terms of anti-racism and and learn from from other uh, situations. Um, The U.S.-Mexico border is an unusual place in the sense that it is possible for me to, well, when COVID-19 is over, get in a car and go and meet somebody in Sierra Juarez and and have a strategizing meeting. Um, And there's an important um, applied social science movement in Mexico that is looking at issues of violations of human rights of trans migrants, people who are from other countries like Northern Central America, but who are uh, passing through Mexico. And so I think it's very important to be aware of these things that are, that are where we have shared interests crossing borders and work towards finding ways to exchange knowledge and, uh, and, and, and skills and best practices. Excellent. Uh, again, I think those are some uh, excellent uh, strategies. I really like the uh, the uh, aspect of cross border uh, strategies, sitting down, dialoguing uh, with others, but also using the creating forums right now, uh, using our, our our technology to create new forums and, and building cross border initiatives. And uh, again, those are opportunities, and, and also shared interests because again. We, we have these interests, we have these issues across different countries and, and to collaborate with others who are struggling with the same thing is, is a, a, another opportunity for applied anthropologists to uh, take, uh, you know, be a part of a new trend, a new agenda. And I see right now, this is a, 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 a unfortunately an opportunity, a new agenda to do many of these cross uh, uh, border strategies since uh, immigration is even much more so in the news now, obviously, for the past year. And it's going to continue, obviously, for the next year, two or three. 
So, uh, so uh, Mark, uh, do you have any uh, kind of like strategies, tangible strategies that applied anthropologists could potentially, you know, uh, be a part of now to address some of perhaps some of the short-term issues as well as some of the long-term issues? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a couple things just building on what's already been said. I mean, you know, um, a, a, a lot of the wars in these in, in this area are now fought on social media. And so, you know, um, using social media to contest these different narratives is really important. And the more you can get in there and do that and, and take some of the research, the cross-border and other, you know, research related to these issues, um, that, that's a very, very powerful you know, way to um, to sort of put yourself in the middle of this, the contestation of these categories. And just as a, a little example, I mean, we, we did a lot of this actually in a recent intervention we had, but um, not long ago we completed a, a small um, qualitative study in the community that one of the communities that we're working with. And this was just, these were 75 life history interviews of recent Central American migrants. And the purpose of that was to, was to think of, you know, to try and construct the sort of social determinants of health, so to speak, as a transnational, um, a, you know, issue. So we, we really tried to get the, use the life history interview format so that we could get this continuum of, you know, what was happening in the home situation, what, the, what was the home situation like, you know, what were the reasons for migration, what happened during migration, what happened when you got here, and, you know, if, if there was more attempts or attempts at migration, you know, we did that in multiple cycles. But um, so we, we have this, a lot of narratives where, you know, we were specifically trying to frame this, you know, in a, in a transnational context and to, to illustrate, you know, the, the human stories here. And it, it would be, if we had some extra funding to do this, it would be very useful to, you know, to put these kinds of stories on social media and have people, you know, talk about this and, and, and break that or try to, to break that, that um, construction that Joe was talking about of, of the sort of the Mexican, you know, um, because there's so many, you know, again, uh, difficult stories and, and people... People generally, throughout this, this this whole narrative, this Trumpian, I'm sorry, asshole narrative, um, you know that that uh, I could, I'm really being nice. You know, I, I my my language descended into the, the worst invective throughout the whole Trump whatever. Um, I got I got pretty creative when I ran out of you know when I got to the bottom level and ran out of words. I invented new ones. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, so uh, I think I lost my train there, but yeah, to, you know, to take some of those stories and to, to realize, I mean, you have, to, you have to ask the question just at a basic human level, why would a mother send her child out of her house at 5 a.m. to go across Mexico to, you know, through Guatemala or through Honduras and go across Mexico and try to get to the U.S.? You know, what mother... You know, what would cause a mother to do that? You know, just mother to mother or parent to parent across the racial line. You, you, you have to realize that there's something extreme going on there, you know, and to try and, you know, illustrate, you know, what what was that extreme issue and, and where does it come from? Because, you know, again, with this sole issue of Central American migrants, people just, that narrative, even though some pundits put it out there, it really never got embedded that, that, you know, sort of the gang-related violence in Honduras and El Salvador and Guatemala is an American export. We exported MX, MS-13, Calle 18, and some of these other, you know, gangs. They're American exports resulting from Im immigration policy, and that's a whole other issue. Um, but they've taken hold in, 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 in conditions of, you know, extreme poverty and other things there. So... So you have these, you know, gang-controlled areas and a lot of, um, you know, very difficult situations of, of violence. And if you read some of these narratives of why people left um, and, and what happened to them when they, on the way, you know, it's, and you can really put those out there in social media or whatever. I mean, hopefully that will at least humanize some of these situations. I mean, 
just, just thinking of some of the narratives, and we, we have a couple publications with this particular um, little study, but, you know, there was a woman who talked about being in a warehouse. You know, some of the migrants she was with, they um, there were some, um, the, the coyotes, somehow they, they were... Uh, they were put in a warehouse with other migrants that was controlled by the Zetas. You know, a, it was a, 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 a cartel controlled, you know, warehouse and they were threatening people uh, to, you know, that they would, they would take out their organs and, and uh, if they didn't pay more money to their coyotes. And there were, you know, so these, these people are in this warehouse for, for a period of time. And this one woman escaped this one situation she was in with an incredible act of bravery. I mean, she said, we were asking her, how did you, you know, she was in this little place with a bunch of, with, with, with uh, cartel members who were actually playing Russian roulette with, with a lineup of these migrants who were on their knees, you know, and um, she said to the person next to her in a whisper, she said, you know what, there's dirt on the floor here, grab a handful of dirt, throw it in their face, and let's run, and that's what she did. She grabbed dirt, and the other people grabbed dirt, and they ran after throwing the dirt in the face of this. Now, I mean, you know, really? I, you know, these people have gone through a lot, and you have to humanize that through however you can to break some of these, these ridiculous and disgusting narratives that have become dominant. Anyway, sorry for the... No, very good point. Well, again, that was uh, so important. Where you mentioned you using social media uh, and and highlighting uh, a lot of these uh, situations to humanize what's really going on. And I, I, again, I like what you said using the transnational context of your from your research, and uh, and then that's where people and I think others may not see this is a. The basic issue of survival and putting uh, uh, that narrative more of a what the similarities are of what people struggle, uh, what they're struggling through, uh, has an opportunity to bring people more together as opposed to separate. And so, you know, really thank you, uh, Mark, for bringing uh, that particular point up. Uh, Sarah, did you have anything, the uh, uh, final thing? to uh, highlight on the potential short-term strategy. Uh, you've indicated, you set the stage for it. Any other additional uh, I'm not, suggestions? I'm not sure I have any actual solutions, but I would like to, as a follow-up to what I was talking about earlier, bring your attention to, is it Mariella? Uh, comment in the chat where she says, it is often the most effective, that response, to protect their communities. In the very short term, Asian American organizers and my colleague, when I was talking with him about last week, said that, immediately began sharing bystander de-escalation strategies right after the shootings. As applied anthropologists, we are often slow or too slow. This is her opinion. I'm not going <laughs> to, but I would say let's think about it to respond to the short term when immediacy and urgency are necessary. So I think we can work, I don't know exactly how we do that, to position ourselves to where um, in whatever situation it might be, whatever one of these systems were, were um, perhaps have some uh, background in which to offer to, to say, I'm here. You know, if you want me, if you want my help, if you uh, not necessarily take over, that's not what I mean, but just, you know, to to also be there or to be there for, in the cases of um, some somewhere where you might be the actual member of the group that something is happening to, that you have those skills to respond and yet you may or may not use them. And so I don't, I don't know if all anthropologists are slow to respond. Uh, I don't necessarily want to say that, and Mariella, I don't know if you want to say anything to that point, but I get your point. He did talk about how overnight, literally from last week to this week, he feels that he has become this major activist 
and hasn't done any other work, and he's missing class, and you know, and he's very, he definitely jumped in there. I don't know all those details, but um, you know, he did definitely. Uh, I think what he was telling me would support your statement. Uh, that's not a strategy, Eric. I'm sorry, I'm kind of popping out on you. But I think it it's something definitely food for thought. Yeah, and I I, I would like to uh, follow up on that on that because many times uh, I think as applied anthropologists uh, we're not aware of the skills that we can offer or have uh, to address certain things that are happening in the here and now. You know, tragic events uh, that are happening. Uh, I think we're in a reactionary mode, but I think we do have multiple skills to assist. Uh, events that are happening from one one time period to another and if we give it an opportunity to uh, at least connect with the other experts uh, or uh, scholars who are uh, assessing or um, those who are working on a traumatic event uh, i think when we see things in a much more holistic perspective and that's what i'm trying to get to how i think is applied at the public that's our training we see it in a very holistic perspective. And that's what's to me, is kind of missing in the short-term issues of, of when racist actions happen. Uh, people see things in, a, in the present and don't see the full picture. So we can uh, be of assistance in the short term as well as in the long term and, and, and developing long-term strategies. But in the here and now, and I'm glad the uh, individual asked the question, uh, Yes, it's, it appears that sometimes we're slow to react, but I think it's just like at my university. <laughs> let, let me just say here, over the years, I've been to other universities, and for the life of me, a lot of administrators don't see or recognize my skills as an applied anthropologist. And I can talk on and address a lot of these issues that are happening in our community and at other places that I've been, but... Uh, uh, once I make them aware of what I can potentially assist, they are kind of surprised. So I think we have to, uh, many, uh, and I'm sure all of us are doing it in various ways, but as, as Mark indicated, we have to use our the new technology, the, the social media, to get our platforms out there, to get our issues and, and show examples of how we are addressing these issues on a regular basis. And that's how we can be more proactive. And I'm, I'm a per, uh, I always prefer to be proactive instead of react, reacting. And uh, therefore, we're not perceived as uh, reacting in a slow fashion. So I think we can take advantage, like we are doing right now in this forum. You know, follow up this forum with other uh, specific strategies, short-term strategies after this, uh, after this session or in the short term, develop another type of discussion along these areas, along these issues that are happening now. So again, I think you, you mentioned skills. We do have the skills, and we just have to accentuate those skills on another level. Uh, uh, with that, uh, Joe, did you have any uh, follow-up uh, issues, uh, comments on uh, so we're approaching towards 3.30 now? And I'm just trying to wrap everything up. Uh, do you have any kind of like uh, of, of final closing remarks on these issues of racism and uh, social injustice? Not and and just take it uh, in uh, perhaps in a in a, in a different way. Uh, uh, whatever major statement that you would like to say for this session, and then we potentially could follow up on our uh, on our meetup uh, after this. Yeah, well, I, I think um, that we um, need to, um, uh, first of all, I think we, we, have a, we have skills that are underutilized for uh, application that, that, that in many ways build on, and I know not everybody at SFAA is a university teacher, but that build on our teaching skills, and I think we need to be... Um, thinking about what lessons we've learned about uh, teaching for teaching the public, for teaching 
uh, people in uh, public life, for uh, communicating, um, for writing um, public policy documents, for writing things for the media. This is in con conjunction with Mark's comment about social media. I think we're, we, we're, we're and, and teaching can be overwhelming, you know. I have got, this, this week has enabled me to, to postpone grading uh, 20 theory papers, uh, which I'm not looking forward to. But, um, but nevertheless, um, as my advisor, Eric Wolf, uh, <laughs> said, one of the things I will always carry, uh, among many things I will carry from him was, he said, uh, if you can teach something to an undergraduate, you really understand it. And so, anyway, this is just one thought that came to me as we talked about how we can be effective. Um, I, I think that we also, uh, so I think this is part of uh, larger reflections on being effective applied anthropologists. I mean, to be effective in the struggle against racism, you know, we can't be everything. Some of us can be activists, you know, full time. Uh, some of us can be uh, teaching. Some of us can be doing research. Uh, we need to figure out how those different roles can be brought to bear. We need to think about what our skills and roles are. We need to think about what our skills and roles are and how they can be brought to bear. Um, and uh, we need to think about, you know, what is a workable contribution from the point of view of our um, skill set and our role set. So I, I've reflected some on those over the years, and anybody who's interested, in, I'm happy to share uh, uh, work that I've done. Excellent, Joe. Again, those are some great points where we're using uh, the teaching skills uh, for the public, for communicating with uh, also with the media. Uh, and I like when you said you can't be everything. I mean, that is so important uh, where you and tip to choose your roles, your skills, and um, work on workable, workable contributions. Excellent. Uh, Mark, do you have any final uh, take-home uh, suggestions? Uh, no, I mean, I would, you know, reinforce what, what, what Sarah and Joe have said. Um, you know, but, but there are, I mean, we do have a lot of skills. And if you are working with, you know, let's say in the case, I mean, I'm working out of a public health school, but it is sort of one foot in the academic and one foot in the applied context. So, you know, we're working constantly with, you know, collaborating with different organizations. And, and you know, this is an overused word, so I apologize in advance for repeating it again uh, because it, you know, begins to lose its meaning. But... But, you know, approaching those collaborations with, with humility and with the understanding that, you know, we, we are at the table with other groups um, trying to address these things. They have knowledge that we do not have. Um, we have some knowledge that they don't have, some skills and some leverage at, you know, writing a grant or, you know, doing other things like that. And so, you know, our, um, I mean, this is a sort of a classic applied anthropology role as a, as a broker as a broker between, you know, communities and worlds that will help, um, you know, groups in the, in the community that are, um, that are experiencing these things, combat them in some way, you know, by being able to gain resources or gain access to something that they did not gain, you know, have access to before. So, you know, anything you can do in those collaborative relationships where, you know, you are, a, you know, in some ways, a, partially a vector for for you know the stories and the knowledge that comes from the, the community uh, to you know let's say a funding organization I mean those are all those are all very useful and and just you know again I, I agree with the whole you know issue of, of, of teaching I mean the more we can put out narratives and the more we can put out narratives in non-traditional you know yeah there are academic journals and conferences and policy papers and things like that, but they're, you know, the social media, the other ways in which we get those things out there where people can can hear and, and see, feel, and touch them is, is you know, you know, these are contributions we can, we can make. And I, I will have to, um, with apologies, I will have to leave because I have to teach a class. <laughs> okay, okay, we're, we're I just
just finished my grading. <laughs> well, well, thank, thank you, uh, Mark. I appreciate it. We do truly appreciate your time. And let me just say thank you so much for organizing this entire conference. I know it's been tough, but I just want to get that out there for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It wasn't just me. There were, I know. There were lots of people involved. But, uh, yeah, and I'm glad it's turning out. I'm really, this is great. I am glad to see. I mean, look, look at all the people that are here today. I mean, <laughs> you know, so that's excellent. Glad thank you, Mark. So thank you all, and thank you, Eric, for organizing this. Sure. Thank you, Eric. And, and Sarah, yeah. do you have any final thoughts? I'm uh, good. I think I'm good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, with that, uh, I, 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 again, I appreciate, I know, Sarah, you're rushing to be here, and I truly appreciate your uh, uh, participating, and I, I know I didn't provide as much information, but I wanted to keep it informal, and I wanted to uh, uh, somehow kind of get more personal in our discussion as opposed to just a presentation, and this, to me, I think this roundtable provided some, uh, you know, really good concrete thoughts, uh, strategies, framing it out. And so others can really take the lead and, and, and we can follow up on what we're doing. And I just really like how uh, we, we all kind of saw a lot of commonalities. And, and like Mark just said, we're still using this classic anthropology broker type of role. Uh, and even in, in 2021, I mean, this is what I was taught when I was a <laughs> undergraduate. Anthropologist is supposed to be a broker, and we're still uh, coming back to those classic roles and those opportunities that we can uh, assist uh, the issues of racism and and social injustice. And and that's another reason why I would want to finish up why I teach in my class race and ethnic relations. Even at you know uh, to undergraduates because I I get I get a sense that they really need a framework and they're ready to do something about it. There's they are tired of reactionary and I feel committed uh, that using my skills is to uh, are to um, basically frame out the issue, provide some concrete strategies, allow the next generation of concern. Uh, applied anthropologists and scholars of all different backgrounds and specialties to develop their new strategies. And so that's what I'm really excited about each and every semester with my students. These are just fresh undergraduate students. They have great new strategies to improve race relations on campus and places where they live. And those are concrete, to me, concrete steps that we that I know I can get my students to feel better about things that are happening in their world and also nationally and globally because, again, that's what uh, I feel they really need. They need to see uh, anthropologists and scholars providing uh, that type of uh, roadmap to give them the skills to, to take action and develop these newer and fresh strategies uh, of, in, in today's standards. So I think uh, we're about... We're at 339, 340, and I, I believe that which should be, uh, uh, that's my final comments. So there you are. That is the roundtable discussion, roundtable discussion that I had with my colleagues uh, just a, a few weeks ago. And uh, I want to, again, thank uh, each and every one of them to, uh, for their excellent insight uh, their scholarly interpretation of the issues, Dr. Heyman, Dr. Edberg, uh, Dr. Alexander. And uh, as you can tell, we were very focused on trying to get this message out, trying to get these issues out in a completely do a different way. And that's the reason why I'm doing this uh, podcast show, podcast show number 50. Number 50 is a host uh, hosting uh, where I hosted a panel discussion on human rights and social justice roundtable on social justice, so ra racism and social injustice. So with that said, I want to thank our sponsors again, Podbean, Podbean. I want to thank uh, iHeartRadio, iHeartRadio. I want to thank Apple Podcasts, Apple Podcasts. I want to thank Google Play, Google Play. And I want to thank, uh, yes, ABC Clio 
ABC Clio and Amazon Prime, Amazon Prime, and ABC Clio for uh, um, publishing my book, uh, 2018. But I really want to thank uh, my uh, colleagues in this roundtable discussion. It was outstanding, and uh, we're we're. We're doing our part more, more than I think uh, we uh, we even have ventured to. So again, thank you, and uh, look forward to hearing from each and every one of you. Please do uh, still email me at ejb678 at gmail.com. That's ejb678 at gmail.com. Take care, everyone. We out. <laughs>